Welcome everyone to our live stream behind the system. Uh, in today's uh, live stream, Marco Krem will tell you all about fluid design with tokens. Um, let's move on. Your host for today uh, is our chief evangelist, Mike, and myself, Robert. Uh, but before we dive into the talk, some housekeeping. Um, this session will be recorded and afterwards available on our website and on our YouTube channel at Token Studio. You can use the chat to everyone, also noticing that uh, uh, most of you already found it. Uh, you can also use the Q&A button um, in the button to ask questions. At the end of the talk, we will zoom into some of the questions. Um, and you can also use the upvote button. And depending on the upvotes, we will go through uh, those questions. Um, this is a safe space, so please be kind and respectful. Uh, more information about this can be found on tokens.studio slash code of conduct. Keep an eye out on our channels uh, for future live streams. And if you have any ideas or suggestions, please contact us via support at tokens.studio. But before we dive into the talk, I want to first pass the mic to Mike. Uh, so take it away. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Uh, yeah, like uh, Robert said, Marco with, uh, here with us today. Uh, Marco and I uh, have been in Dutch for quite a while now. Um, and over the last year, uh, we have regularly been brainstorming about um, easy and sometimes crazy concepts in tokens. Uh, I think one of those crazy ones was uh, typography, fluid typography and, and fluid scales. Um, and uh, yeah, I think Marco has done some really uh, crazy token architecting here. Uh, to bring yeah fluid into tokens. Um, so yeah, I'll keep it short as usual, but I'll be back in the Q&A later uh, and I'll be available in the chat. So uh, Marco, take it away. Thanks a lot, Mike and Robert. And I think we just start and dive into it directly. So I'll gladly share, uh, steal the screen from Robert and let me start off. <clears throat> So thanks everybody for joining in. Uh, it's a pleasure to be like with Token Studio, uh, which is actually a big part to enable this <laughs> this talk because without Token Studio, we would, would not be able to do this. Um, so uh, I'm a lucky opportunity to present something to you that's like really cool. And it's like from static to dynamic, how we can actually have dynamic interfaces in Figma already and also in code in the future. This is kind of like really geeky talk. Be prepared for some heavy formulas um, and some quite deep token structure, uh, but we bring it to the basics down in a second. So let me introduce myself. Um, my name is Marco. I'm from Austria. I'm a freelance token architect focusing full-time on token architecture. Um, nothing else anymore. <laughs> so like, I'm deep in that game now. Uh, I mostly work on multi-branded headless design systems, so just abstracting everything to a new level that we can achieve, like this headless approach and like multi-brand, like as how brands, because 40 sub-brands are delivering their design system components to serve every brand. A little fun fact about me, I have three little chickens. They're called Pepper, Fritzi, and Gertrude. So they're lovely, but they also like to break out, so they're somewhere around, roaming around the garden. But... Let's also do some housekeeping first. So resources and questions. Yes, this presentation will be available later on. So we'll find all this information and we will share it in the channel. Uh, please feel free to reach out if you have any questions on the, the Token Studio um, Slack. And also if you have questions, we created a little channel which is called BTS um, Fluid Design. Um, you can also put your questions there and we, we I'll try to answer them later if we are not able to answer them in the QA section of this talk. Uh, so. I'll try to catch up, maybe not today, but in the next days. Let's dive into it. What is a fluid interface, actually? So the definition is a user interface that adapts and responds to any screen size, resolution, or orientation. What does that mean? It doesn't mean like an interface should adapt however you're using it. If you're using a smartphone, a tablet, a desktop that's responsive design already but it doesn't matter which resolution you have it it doesn't matter if it's like a folder or whatever so looking at this i can already adapt my design so as you saw like i just moved my design completely to go bigger and have like a tablet design now and that's actually real life figma code no no magic back behind that that's already tokenized 
So benefits, it improves the user experience, gives you better accessibility. And as you can see, it's a consistent design across devices. So it's really cool, as you can see, how our interface just shifts between the different breakpoints. And like these components are always the same. Yes, there's limitations, technical limitations. We will come to them a bit later. But as you can see, like not only did the typography change on this screens, as you can see, it gets bigger and bigger. Also, the spacing of the header or hero actually changes regarding to the width. So that's also something we can do, spacing and typography. In this talk, we're actually focusing more on the typography because spacing is like another level of abstraction. And it's the same principle you will see later on the formulas, but it gets even crazier sometimes. So let's move on. What are the steps to actually go to a fluid interface? The first one is to create your spa uh, type and spa uh, space and sizing scales. So how does actually like the starting point look like of my scale and how does my end point look like? So you add the smallest breakpoint and the biggest breakpoint of your devices, your mobile, your desktop. Then you actually calculate the in-between values. So we don't want to put like values, hard values for every breakpoint. Uh, we just want to have a fluid transition between every breakpoint. And by this, you are able to adapt to every situation. You're able to see whatever like devices introduced to the market. You're hopefully able to already give it a really nice look and feel. So next step is transform these functions to code. Tricky part sometimes, but code is always way ahead of us in, 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 in implementation. There's already some solutions for that in code. And the last one is actually enjoying like a fluid interface in real time and like in the reality. But let's get into it and, and see the magic actually work of this fluid interface and, and what we need to do. <laughs> this meme is actually on purpose because we will we'll get a bit tricky now. So first we want to create a harmonious type typography scale. Um, this is actually um, inspired by uh, Victor Neistat's article that is also inspired again by <laughs> Spencer Mortensen's article. So I think Victor is actually in the chat today. So if any typography related questions, please reach out to him because he's a typographer and I'm actually just a token nerd. So if you have questions about typography, he's the right guy to ask. If you have questions about crazy token structure, you can ask me. Um, so this typography scale is actually based on the musical pentatonic five-tone scale. And as you can see down, there's the formula for it. So it has a fundamental frequency, which is our F0. It has a ratio that it steps, which is our R. And then it has like actually the steps in the scale, the I and the number of notes in the scale. So this is the basic formula. I know it looks a little confusing, but let's step ahead. So filling out these values with, with actually real data it's like our mental frequency is one RAM, our basic font size, it's 16 pixel. You can start uh, differently by starting lower on your topography scale and then just scaling up, or you start at 16 and then I'll go down and up on your scale. The ratio here is two to get closer to the like pentatonic five tone scale. Um, five is actually five tone, as you can think about like number of notes. And the step in the scale is actually our F1, which gives us actually our step in the scale, our number one. So moving on, how do we actually pull, pull this off in tokens? In tokens, you can see, um, we start out with, by creating constants, I call them. These are my constants that I need to calculate. It's the F0, the R, and the N value. So the nodes and the ratio. Ratio we have of two, and nodes we have five. Um, the step is then calculated here by F1 by just hard coding the number one into this formula. But you can already see there's something more in this formula. It's not just like that calculation we saw before. So let's move on. Here we have a closer look into this calculation with just like smaller tokens here. Um, and we are adding actually a rounding function to this formula of the harmonic type scale. This rounding solves one problem, which is like, Going this scale down, you will end up with a jump from the rounding, which is like the increment between 9 and 11 and 11 and 12. So the stepping is not as nice as it should, could be because you have a bigger jump in the smaller section than in the bigger section. That's just because of the rounding of the numbers. So 
a solution that Victor came up with is actually rounding up the to the nearest half pixel. Should be no problem on modern mobile devices to like solve uh, half a pixel in the resolution. We always have this there. So how does actually our final scale look like? So we enter again our 16, 2, and 5 as our variables. And then you can see you get a really nice growing scale with the values of 10.5, 12, 14, 16, 18.5, 21, 24, and so on and so on. You probably guess you get the game. So moving on. As we talked before, we want to now add another breakpoint. We want to add the end breakpoint. For the end breakpoint, we will actually add another calculation, which is then, um, for example, I take here 360 pixels as our smallest breakpoint and 1920 as our biggest breakpoint. And in here, I just changed my F0 to be 18 pixels. So I just slightly increased the body size. And I changed my ratio to 2.8 because I think like on big screens, I can also go bigger with my headlines. Looking at this here, if you look at the scale, it also grows faster than like our regular scale. So the ratio actually defines how fast it grows. But then we also run into one problem. And that's something you maybe need to figure out yourself at a later point. It's like if you have your F minus three, so looking at the names here, you can see that's actually minus three. And down here, we have a plus three. And the F3 is actually like getting smaller on a big device. So that's something where you probably need to figure out how your tire property scale works. Like if you want to start out like this, maybe you need to adjust a bit and maybe you don't want to go smaller and add an if query there, or you just like don't scale the, the smaller portions of your typography. Something to keep in mind. For the future, I just wanted to show it off here that it, this is also a, a possible outcome of your scale and you have to consider this. Going forward, we want to add a fluid value and this is where it gets a bit interesting. So in Figma, we currently don't have the option of adding a fluid value. There is no viewport width like we have in a web design. So for the ones that don't know code too much, uh, VW, the unit you can see here, that is actually standing for viewport width. And that's a, like gives you the, the width of your screen and you take part of it in your, to your calculation to calculate actually the, the font size. But why is there also like the RAM value in here? So the RAM value, most of you know, that's actually a base font size. That's the 16 pixels as we defined before. And these 16 pixels um, are there to give us an accessible scale. So if you scale up your font, you also want to scale up the fluid scaling. So that's why we need to combine viewport width and relative font size to give us our right graph. <laughs> Hope still some of you are catching on, but it's, you know, it's, I told you it's getting geeky and complex. So looking at this formula here, we have like the negative value again, which is not working pretty well. So that's something we, I would completely cut out and replace with 10.5 pixels in my opinion, to just make this fixed, but we, we still keep it to keep going with, with what we have here. So the importance of a clamp function. Let's shortly go back. We have a fluid size, which is the graph. that is actually calculating a straight line from A to B, from point 10.5, or let's say from um, 21 to 27 pixels. But if we have this graph, it doesn't end at this point. It would just go straight up. And like at some point we would have a font size of zero pixels and it would scale up immense, like big. If you have a like 4K screen, it would just scale and scale and scale. So the solution is a clamping function. A clamping function is nothing more than a minimum value and a maximum value nested in each other. So it takes three values, it takes like your fluid value, takes your minimum value or the maximum value. And then it calculates if that value is actually in between these two boundaries of your min, min, viewport, uh, min font size and max font size. So if you have it in between there, you can then like see, okay, I'm limiting it at like 27 pixels at the top and I'm limiting at 21 pixels at the bottom. This is already available in web and easy to implement to other platforms because it's simple math calculations that you're able to do. Um, also, will be added to Token Studio is wrong because I think it was in the release yesterday. So I think 
there's now a clamp function actually in Token Studio. Um, but in this example, I will show you that you don't even need the clamp function. It's a nice accessory that saves you a few lines of code, or actually not a few lines, actually just a few characters. But it helps you create this clamp function. So how does this actually look like? If we look at a graph, so now we actually have our base. Uh, it's 320 pixel here, so oh, I had to move this to 360. Missed out something here. And you can see, like, this is our scale on the smallest breakpoint, and then we have our scale on the biggest breakpoint. And after that, it's always flattening out. So this is our clamping function. It limits that graph in between these, so then it starts to flatten out in smaller and bigger breakpoints. In between, we get a straight line from point A to point B. And this is fully calculated. So you don't need to do any, anything for this. You can just use formulas and it will calculate everything in between. And you will be able to adjust your Figma viewport width uh, to actually give you a dynamic font size, as you saw in the first screen. So moving on, what tokens do we actually need for one fluid size? <laughs> it's quite a lot, to be honest. So we need our font scale for the minimum font. We need our font scale for the maximum font size. Then we need our viewport width. So that's something you need to consider. You need to set your canvas width in Figma with tokens. Otherwise, it, it has no value to calculate. It has no viewport width. But with this, you have a viewport width because you know the width you set on your frame. In most design systems anyways, we will be have predefined breakpoints that we really want to design on. But maybe we don't want, don't want to like do these font sets for every breakpoint. Maybe we just want to have it dynamically calculated because if we switch at some point, we're still able to, to adjust super easy and don't need to go through a lot of tokens to replace what we have there. So then we calculate actually our font size for the first step upwards. We calculate our minimum step, uh, uh, minimum of F1 and our maximum F1. Here you again, you have the rounding in here, as you can see. And this gives us a minimum maximum font size inside of the token. So for the people that don't know, you're actually able to do some basic math operations already in tokens. So you can do rounding, you can div do divisions and everything like this. It's already possible. Um, so maybe you come up with some cool ideas. For example, um, a min function that we will later come on to. It's also really interesting for border radius, but I'll tell you about that later on. So the next one is the fluid calculation. Here it gets a bit more complicated. These formulas are actually taken from Adrian Becher. Um, he has a great article on fluid typography on Smashing Magazine. It's linked in the resources later on. If you want to learn more about the formulas, please look at them. But these give us our viewport width value that we need to calculate and our RAM value that we need for that formula to calculate it and calculate our pixel outcome actually. And here we have our fluid size, which is also rounded here. Um, that is taking the, the V value and R value. And this one actually is the viewport width unit. It's just viewport width divided by 100. It's one viewport width. And now there comes the clamp function. So in the new release, you would actually be able to write clamped here. Uh, we still write a min function and a max function nested in each other that actually limit our fluid value. So moving on from this, I think we need to drop into some actual real oops, um, show off because that was just a lot of talking, but nothing happened here. So let me just show you what we have. Um, I tried to do this on Token Zen Garden. Maybe you heard of it. It's a project by Esther uh, and Mike and Jan and See, yeah, somebody else. <laughs> I forgot all the names. Um, and we will try to release this fluid uh, version of Zen Garden 2. It's currently not completely done. We're still in the process of, of doing everything in the behind the scenes. Also, we need to create some more components. And this is taking some time, as you can imagine. But what I have here is like you can already see, like my viewport width is already selected, and that holds the width of this container here. I have a few elements in here that are like my navigation, my hero, just the text and the footer. It's just a few elements that you want to see. And selecting my outer container, I now want to change it actually. So the easiest thing is I already have predefined breakpoints. 
what happens in these breakpoints is actually the, the only thing changing is to width. So I'm not going to do this now. I just want to go in here and actually change my width. Now it's set to the minimum viewport width because we are mobile first. So we take the smallest breakpoint first and then we scale up. So let's just take a random number of like 1,230, like something. Uh, press save. Hopefully nothing crashes now. This would be typical. As you have seen, interface completely adopts. The font size changed. So let's look at the font size actually, what's in here. It's 51, okay? Let me change it again to a different value. So let's go smaller again. Let's go to 753 pixels of viewport width. Saving, it will change again. You see the difference already. It's jumping. It's not only by line breaks and everything, but it's like also changing the padding. And if we look now, we actually went down to 43 pixels. And if I would now set it actually to a breakpoint that is below our given breakpoint, so let's go to 240, probably messes up the complete design. But let's give it a try. Let's see what happens actually. Well, we run to one issue. We are not able to change our auto layout still. So hopefully Figma finds a solution for this and like Toko Studio in combination that we can also change the flow direction because this will then enable us with quite a lot and maybe the wrapping function will also do, the, do its part. So looking at it now, if we look at the smile and brief headline, it's kept at 33. And 33 was actually our min value of our font size. So oops, let me go down here. We look at our F6, which is our heading. Um, we have a 33 in here. That's our min value. And our max value is 62. So let's test out if actually this font will be limited at 62 pixels. Where's my width here? Let's go big. 3,820. It's 40, right? 3,840. Yeah. Oh, that's got to be big. Let me scroll over. And it's kept at 62, as we have seen down here. Our F6 is kept at 62 pixels. So it's working. That is our fluid typography. And this is a real life example. So looking at this, um, you are able to introduce fluid typography, fluid spacing and everything. What can we do with this? Like, why do we need this? First of all, we want to have maybe a really fluid design. Um, Let's go back to the viewport as good. But also we could save a lot on components because currently we're creating tons of components, right? Everybody of us is creating components after components just to solve these breakpoints because we have maybe a hero that is for as extra small and one for extra large because the typography changes and we need to create these components again because typography is not fixed there and we want to, to serve it. So yeah. Uh, this is something we could tackle with it, but there's still some implementation things that we need to figure out. But I'll show you something later on. But let me show you what I've been also working on to give you a little entrance into fluid typography and sizing. So we have been working on this little tool here, which is a fluid type scale generator and design token integration. So this is just a little tool that gives you the option to do your own type scale, fluid type scale, and actually get tokens out of it. So here you're able to set your min breakpoint. Let's set it to 40 because we maybe want to also solve the problem of the new fold phones and they have 240 pixels sometimes. So it's quite dense. And maybe we need to cover TV too. So let's go 3840. And you can already see like, okay, I have here my values. And then maybe like yeah, on TV, we need to go big. Like one, like 18 pixels is not enough. Let's start out with 28 pixels on TV. And you can already see like down here, you have your scale and it shows you at 240 pixels. You go from 11 to 49 and 3,840, you go really big. Okay, 220 pixels, maybe a bit big, but looking good. Up here, you have a slider that actually is a screen width and you can really like move that slider around and get the pixel width of your current state. So I want to know it at 565 pixels. Also, we have here like our full half steps, as I said before, now it's a full step, kind of go half steps, and then you can see it's going to 10 and a half pixels. And also here it's going to 
the half pixels here, this is actually a fluid value, so I'm not rounding it at the moment, but a calculation to give you a better overview of what the outcome is. Also in this tool, you have a graph that actually shows you how this will look like. And also if you change your screen width, oops, your dots will actually wander. You can check out, okay, at 2,745 pixels, I will be at 116 pixels on MIF8. You can also change your steps. So we don't want to go any steps down, but you will go 12 steps up. And if you want to have a typical typography scale um, and don't want to use this node-based, you just need to remove the nodes. So if you have only one node in a scale, it com completely um, removes this logic. And then you can go with a typical 1.2 scale. And maybe here we take 1.25 and also start at 16. So you can already see you now have your scale. That is a typical typography scale that we are used to work with, but not the pentatonic, if you want to test it out. Um, you also have here your table of like the CSS function, how this one looks like for the implementation. Uh, min max values again in rem and pixel values, also like the fluid calculation. And this one is a really nice one here. You actually have a sample page. Um, probably let me again turn this to, oops, to where we want it to be, like somewhere in between there. And now we can actually oops, scale this sample. And I'm able to really see how this fluid typography comes to life. So how does it really scale? I don't see too much. Let's let's, let's crunch this up a bit. Uh, you can see <laughs> now it's working. Okay, yeah, I can really see this. This one changes, right? And down here, it's still like text fields. So this is an open source repo. If you want to contribute, if any developer wants to contribute, I feel free. So currently, that's it's just taking your local fonts. And you can just like put something here and it, it already adjusts to, to this. So let's say, okay, our body font is also 900. Doesn't look too good, but I'm able to, to really get, get, a, get the feeling of how the, this looks like. And now we're probably the biggest part here for everybody joining in is the tokens. This all creates a like final token file that you can actually just take. Let's jump back to Figma. I have my sample file here. I already have applied here a few tokens to, to these, but as you can see, my current token set is empty. Just pasting in my JSON, saving it, and apply to selection. Oh, maybe let's stick to full canvas. And you can already see it just to this, and let's scale it up because we know at 1,900 pixels, it will probably be pretty massive. Save, apply selection. Oh, it works. So. You're able to just generate like your scale and test it out yourself. You can like reference the, these in your typography tokens and you're just like have a really fast entrance into this fluid typography um, concept. Uh, this is just for typography now. We want to move on and also add spacing and stuff like this, but this is just like, yeah. Um, yeah, crazy. Okay, let's move back to the presentation. So challenges and considerations. Implementation without Token Studio. I currently don't see how you could actually implement this without Token Studio. Um, so you probably need Token Studio to do this. Uh, you end up with quite a massive amount of tokens. As you saw, you for each step, you need like your calculations, your, your V, uh, your variables, and your um, relative value. And for them, you create your clamp function. Um, we currently don't have a viewport with su unit support. Uh, but I'm pretty sure Token Studio will add this in the future. So that will help in the transformation, which is the next part, transforming to CSS and JSON. Um, with the current solution, it's hard to transform because it's a bit hacky. You will replace this 100 scale to like a few port with you unit, actually. And the biggest challenge is actually changing the mindset, how you think about design and design system, to so think more fluid and everything. So. How do you integrate the fluidity into your design system? First, you kind of create your scale, as we said, like that represents most likely what you currently already have. Um, then, unfortunately, because we don't really have an option, you most likely create themes that then render the fixed size 
or actually fixed font size out. So you create your breakpoint seams that you can use on in the project. So you have your mobile first approach maybe and have these breakpoints that are dynamically calculated tokens actually. Um, sync with development, how to implement fluid approaches. Some developers already know clamping functions, some don't. So send them to the Adrian Badger uh, link if they don't know uh, for mobile platforms, it's a bit different, in my opinion, not my strong suit. And the big thing is actually we can we are able to shrink our component variants in the future. So we really are able to shrink down the set of components we need to manage and have to 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 work on. So that's kind of like the big goal here was actually to reduce the, the amount of components we have in our design system. So conclusion, is it a perfect solution? No, by far not. Um, it's still a hacky solution. It's still like not perfect in the implementation. Uh, we currently face a lot of technical barriers. We are not able to change the flow as some suggested in the uh, chat already. Penpot is maybe an option in the future um, that already has it or maybe Figma implemented. I don't know what they are showing currently in the other call, <laughs> but maybe they show off some something like this. Um, fluid interfaces and typography enhance your design system. Yes, they give you a better option to scale and, and change density like on a calculated model. So you are able by changing a few variables and knobs to completely change your interface, how it looks like. Maybe you need a dense interface and the spacing is completely calculated fluidly. And maybe you need a like wide interface for marketing and it's like moving. So there's options everywhere. Um, design tokens play a key role in achieving fluidity. Without the tokens, we can't do the calculations and we're not able to, to achieve this. Um, adopt fluid principles for better user experience and accessibility. This approach is also really good for the accessibility because if people scale up their font size, you're able to uh, scale up the interface completely, adjusting to the user's needs. So what are actually the next steps? Um, getting the viewport width as a unit in Topo Studio, that is like kind of my like request. <laughs> Um, that will help a lot in the calculations and everything. So uh, I think Mike is already, not Mike is not working on it, but some is already working on it. Um, then there's another one that's like baseline grid. So some design systems actually want to achieve a baseline grid adjustment. Um, how does that look like? So in a second. Then the Bezier curve, we want to add a Bezier curve and variable fonts. That's also really interesting. That should also come to my tooling because a lot of fonts change or design systems change their font weight also on scaling. So you start out with a heavy font weight and maybe get lighter in a bigger interface. And maybe Figma native tokens allows us to implement it in a better way. So how is this baseline grid actually looking like? So we currently have here like a baseline grid of 16. No, actually of eight, sorry, uh, or four. And it's like, I can just adjust my viewport width and the line height is actually calculated to really stick to the baseline grid. That thanks again to, to Victor. And like, for example, if I change to 960 pixel, it sticks to the baseline grid. And if I change to 2000, uh, 1,282, still sticks to our grid. Um, if you think that's like fake, let me just shortly jump in here. That's actually our responsive. You can see that's typography. This is just scaled by 200%. So let me just here change to 2000, save, apply to selection. Oops, nothing happens because it's not applied. Oops, now it's applied. And you can see I'm still aligned with the baseline grid just by doing this. So Next thing, Bezier curve. We also want to add a Bezier curve to the to this whole process to make it the fluid, uh, like just readily, like maybe on a small breakpoint, we also want to slowly grow and then like in between a bit stronger at the end also flatten out. Or maybe we just want to start strong and like really scale up on mobile devices because then later on it's not important how it scales because we have enough room, uh, real estate. But maybe on the smaller devices, we want to, to do this. Yeah. I think that's most of it. Um, resources and references are in here. So there is like the repo where actually the tokens are held and the tooling is lying, the fluid type, type scale tool. If you want to join me and like developing this further on, feel free to reach out all the time, like either on Slack or somewhere else. Um, you can check out Spencer Mortensen's article on the harmonic typography scale. Also, Victor has a, a guest on this. 
uh, Adrian Badger, like where you have like the modern fluid typography on Smashing Mac, and Token Studios is the essential to 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 make this happen. Actually, upcoming talks we will have a talk coming up with Esther, Mike, and me on the deep dive onto headless design systems, where we talk more about all these approaches and like a few different topics that are also really interesting. Thanks for listening in, and I think it's time to hand back to Mike and Robert and QA. Hope not everybody fell asleep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Marco. That was uh, amazing. Um, and yeah, I think uh, if you have been following the chat, uh, a lot of people are mind blown. So that is, uh, that's always nice. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, also that we had very clear talk because we only have two questions in the Q&A. Um, so yeah, Robert, where do we start? Yeah, let's uh, kick it off. Maybe uh, Marco, you can read along mm -hmm. in the QA uh, because yes, it's a me up, pretty long question before okay. I stumble up some things. Uh, first question of Pablo. Um, great work. Um, I think a lot of uh, you guys agree with him. Uh, a question that we are now facing for multi devices as iOS, Android, web that has some differences in values, not always with coherence uh, between them as the, uh, the font family, font sizes, and heights. What do you recommend? Uh, change them with mods and unify decisions as your fluids typography or change them as teams changing specific values with atomic typography tokens um so my approach on this is like first of all uh, there needs to be some brand guidelines defined like okay is the brand sticking to one typography that like is going through through all like uh, devices or do you want to adjust to the look and feel of a device so that's something first maybe to consider on a design decision level and then i would actually say override your basis of your calculations because you can keep every all the rest you just change your base your rhythm and your font family and by this you will actually be able to to with a few tweaks as you said in the seam just override few a few settings and you will end up with a complete different topography scale that is still valid for that device so maybe specify to like for that one device with just tweaking a few few knobs here and there to get where you want to actually all right. I hope that answers uh, the question, but otherwise feel free to elaborate in the Q&A. Yeah. Uh, the next one from Josh, and uh, I'm not sure if this is one for Marco or maybe for Mike. Uh, we are having uh, we are having to use custom transforms to get our tokens to work inside Style Dictionary. Any plans to be able to generate styles in different languages like Style Dictionary does? Yeah, so I just already quickly pasted the link in the chat. Uh, last week, we released our uh, style dictionary configurator, which is basically uh, uh, it's, it's a real time uh, playground uh, where, where you can directly uh, load in your, uh, your token studio tokens and uh, click together transforms for all the common platforms uh, without writing a single line of uh, configuration for style dictionary. Uh, and at the same time, it, it directly outputs the configuration file. It shows you the token, uh, the generated tokens, uh, and, and it's highly configurable. Uh, it's in beta. <clears throat> uh, it, uh, Robert also just posted a, a link to one of our YouTube videos on our channel, uh, where uh, uh, Jordan on our team who uh, developed this uh, amazing tool uh, explains in a few minutes uh, how it works and what you can get out of it. Um, in this tool also we have, uh, uh, that th there's another important thing in there, uh, as many of you may have stumbled on, uh, to transform some of the tokens, you will need uh, some custom style dictionary uh, code or uh, you have to use our token transformer package. Uh, and the really cool thing is that now also uh, we have a package called uh, custom style dictionary transforms you can find that on our github organization uh, and we probably will post the link here also quickly so you can use the style dictionary configurator to set up your pipeline and then you can integrate the uh, custom transforms package uh, uh, in your uh, github action for example and uh, then everything should be working out of the box so that's really cool uh, there's a channel on our Slack as well uh, for the Style Dictionary Configurator. So if you're using it, if you have feedback, uh, feel free uh, to, to yeah, uh, connect with us on Slack or to raise issues uh, on the repository. Yeah. Back to Robert. You are muted. 
sorry for that one. Maybe as a follow-up <laughs> on that one, this works better probably. Uh, and can we automate it? Uh, it's also from uh, from Josh as a follow-up question on the previous one. Sorry, can we automate? Uh, uh, yes, can we just automate formers. it? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm, that, that, I'm not sure what, what exactly is meant with the question, can we automate it? But yeah, uh, I think it's pretty automated now. You click together your transforms and then uh, the, I think in, in the future, you'll be able to also uh, generate the output uh, for a GitHub action, for example. And it's about the pipeline, by the way, Mike. I just uh, see something. Ah, okay, yeah, the pipeline. Yeah, so uh, yeah, you will be able to automate this. So this style dictionary configuration together with the uh, custom transforms package uh, 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 together with the GitHub action, uh, you will be able to automate this. So essentially when you push your tokens back to the repository, uh, you can let this GitHub action run in combination with the config that you have generated and the package uh, and then uh, yeah, it will run automatically. So it should be um, a very little work now to get up and running. That's that's absolutely how it is. Yeah. All right, next Great. question. Thanks for that answer. The next question from Kylie, which is one for uh, Marco. I think was it West, West, West before that, right? Or let's, yeah, let's... Uh, I now click this one. So let's first do that <laughs> one, and then we can go over to the, to the next one. Um, can you talk a bit about organizing your breakpoint using teams versus sets? Uh, would you have to use different Figma file per breakpoint? So let me show you actually how we do this in, in uh, Zen Garden. Um, yes, I solve it actually with different sets that are here files, but you don't need to do files. Um, you can do this just with sets. And these sets hold then just the information. So here I actually change space around for the container. And I also just have one variable, which is the viewport width, which I overwrite for that one theme. So looking at it, if I now actually select this frame and go to my light 960, it actually will activate 600 and 960. And it just like overrides the width. So it's mobile first, it activates all the sets and gives me this option. So it's like just activating themes that override again the width and maybe some other variables. And if I want to go mobile first, I start overriding on each breakpoint and had that like head bigger like this. So going to 1,264, it's also just like a click away. And maybe that one also like, um, there's another question of viewport width. If we are able to watch them right next to each other, yes, easily, because you just like copy it, set it to a different breakpoint, and boom, you have your two frames right next to each other and see how they actually look like. So this is really easy to do. So maybe two for the question. So is there any way to display two viewports next to each other instead of having the override, uh, the one with value that swap back and forth? No, you can do this by applying different themes to different frames. And this is the way to actually solve this problem pretty easily. And you can just like see your design in all different viewports that you 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 kind of have as defined as themes. And also if you have different brands, you could also watch it in different brands there too. So mobile, it's like this then. Great. Cool. Awesome. Thanks. That uh, I think that really uh, answers the question well. Uh, Kylie also replies that it answers the question. And now we can go over to the question of Wes. Um, has anyone done a performance analysis when you put that much math in your CSS, especially on mobile? So um, in CSS, you don't end with, with a lot of math. You actually like resolve these tokens to the clamping function only. So there's not like these, all these calculations are not happening in the CSS anymore. In the CSS, you only use, use like this clamping function as the RAM value that we put with. Um, if you use all calculations, like calc a lot, it will be different. But like just having a few, few like type scale variables with a clamping function is, is okay. If you calculate everything with a calc function, it can be tricky with some like lower performance mobile devices. Uh, but here you end up with maybe tw 12 to, to 18 calculations on the viewport and depending on your spacing, how you actually do this, a few more. But that's only if you resize. So then it, the calculation re-happens. So it's like pretty good on performance still. Okay, thanks, Marco. Yeah, so there are no more questions uh, in the Q&A. Uh, if you have another question, uh, please post it now. Uh, and if not, uh, then we're gonna bring the live stream to an end. 
So uh, I see, thank you uh, in the questions. Ah, one more, okay, let's wait for it. <laughs> uh, maybe in between I can share that, uh, as mentioned at the uh, beginning of the, of the live stream, we will post this video on our YouTube. Uh, we hope to get it out as soon as possible. We will also uh, uh, share all the relevant links in the description over there. So if there's anything you miss, you can uh, check our YouTube channel to just get up to speed again. Yeah. Let me also put the tooling link into the chat now, if somebody wants to check that out actually. Well, it's already okay what were you using to align to your grids earlier it seemed as though the page uh the page padding was changing automatically between desktop and mobile yeah good good observation marco yeah <laughs> so actually like that's what i said like it's not only uh, fluid typography it's also fluid spacing um let me share again so we also have our spacing values here oops in our global story yep where are you Guys, here you guys. So also here in my size and spacing, I actually also use a spacing token. That's for example here to, to do the spacing, it's like fluid 200 to 6,000. And this is actually what changes the spacing on the element here on the overlay, I think on the container actually, um, which changes the spacing of this one. So if I go here, container, you can see it scales up. Now it's 96 here. And on this one here, it actually is 32. This is still a bit wanky because you would end up with quite a lot of tokens for different use cases. So I don't really see the perfect solution at it yet. Uh, maybe in the future, like if we can have two values that you put some function or something like this, uh, that would be really cool to resolve it because then you don't need a special token for every <laughs> calculation that you want. You can give it just start and end and maybe in between it can be calculated. So that's currently, it is an option to do. Like you can already do it if you're like, no, okay, you have like quite a few of them and then you can align it. So. Follow up question directly on this again by Kylie. Yeah. Uh, do you use grids at all? Um, this is kind of based on a grid, but we are currently not able to actually change the grid in Figma via tokens. So uh, limiting factor, uh, like it would be easy to do the grid changes if you have the option to do it in tokens. It's a super simple calculation to, to get your columns right and your spacings and, and, and um, also your gap calculations. So you could maybe do your own overlay, but then it's again, no shortcut to disable, enable workarounds. Solve it. All right. All right. I think that was it, uh, Mike. Yeah, that's it. So that brings us to the end of our live stream today. Marco, thank you so much. This was amazing stuff. Uh, and I'm really happy that, you know, the repository and the tool is available uh, open source and online. Uh, yeah, Marco, you just posted the link there in the chat. So guys, check it out. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think uh, if there are any developers here or any developers in your company and you have ideas, um, just to remind, it's an open source repository. So apart from reaching out, I think Marco would also be really happy to see uh, uh, PRs on yeah. the repository. Um, and, and I think this has great potential. There are so many other things that we can do with this. So uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, see this initiative uh, progress in the future. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and as Marco mentioned, there's, there's a Slack channel as well. So uh, we would be happy to you know, talk more around this topic in the channel. Um, yeah. And that's it for today. Marco and Robert, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, that was a great one. Uh, up to the next one. Bye, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks everybody Thanks for joining. Bye-bye.